Hello and welcome to this lesson on gas exchange in insects. You'll find in 6.2 in your book. In this lesson, we're going to learn about how insects manage to get as much oxygen as they can while conserving their water balance. In the last lesson, we learned about how small organisms have a large surface area to volume ratio. They don't have a large surface area, but compared to their volume, they do. And so for small creatures, for small insects, maintaining their water balance is actually really, really important because they have so much area compared to their volume that they can easily lose it. Now, that works as an advantage if you're trying to absorb oxygen, but there's that offset that we're always trying to consider. So let's have a look at what, what an insect does to conserve that water balance while getting as much oxygen as it can. So one of the ways that an insect will help to conserve its water is that it has an exoskeleton. That means its skeleton is on the outside. Our skeleton is very much on the inside. So our permeable covering, our skin, is able to lose water. Of course, for an insect, it has a much smaller size, which gives it a larger surface area to volume ratio. So it's much more readily going to lose water. So by putting the skeleton on the outside and calling it an exoskeleton, that's one way it helps to conserve its water. However, that's at the cost of absorbing oxygen. How does it absorb its oxygen? It doesn't have lungs like we do. However, it does have something called tracheae. And if we imagine this potato is our insect, and I'm going to give this insect a lot of tracheae. These are long tubes that permeate through the insect so that each tube is in close proximity to respiring cells. Now these tracheae are supported by rings, very much like our trachea is supported by rings of cartilage and that helps to keep the tracheae fixed and open all the time. And just like our trachea branches into tracheoles, so does that of the insect. It's trachea, it's a bigger tube, and then that branches into smaller and smaller tubes, which penetrate further and further into the insect, right next to respiring cells. And this way, atmospheric air is brought into really close contact with respiring cells, so that the diffusion distance is indeed very, very short. So here is my diagram of a trachea, and these indeed are my tracheoles. I have my supporting rings, which keep the trachea, trachea open. So how does the insect actually ensure it gets enough oxygen? Well, let's consider the tracheoles as a tube. Here is atmospheric air. And at the other end, it's next to respiring cells. Well, as those respiring cells begin to use oxygen for aerobic respiration, the concentration of oxygen at this end of the tube gets lower. At the other end of the tube, it's atmospheric oxygen. So straight away, we've got a concentration gradient and just simply by diffusion, oxygen is gonna make its way down that tracheole. Likewise, we're gonna end up with a concentration of carbon dioxide going the other way. The second system relies on something called mass transport. And mass transport is the movement of substances over a relatively large distance using pressure to move it through tubes. So of course, moving the blood around our circulatory system is an example of mass transport. Plants absorbing water from the roots and traveling through the xylem is an example of mass transport. And insects use the same mechanism. So how does this work, this mass transport in an insect? Well again, let's consider the tube and the muscles around that tube. If muscles squeeze around that tube, what we can do is slightly squeeze the tube and that in turn squeezes the gases in that tube in one direction or the other and that just aids the diffusion of gases. 
Okay, now the third method is a little bit more complicated. And it takes us back to that original diagram that we had on the board of the tracheae and the tracheoles. Now, the thing we haven't mentioned is that when the gases, the oxygen, for example, diffuses down the tracheole uh, to move into the respiring cells, it dissolves in some water first. If you remember, all gas exchange surfaces are moist. Likewise, when carbon dioxide is coming out of the insect, it goes into a little bit of water before it moves into the gaseous phase and diffuses out through the tracheole. So as we've just mentioned, there's a little bit of water at the end of the tracheoles. And when an insect undergoes a rapid burst of activity, maybe it's about to fly off from a predator, then the cells around the tracheoles start to respire anaerobically. And this produces lactate. Now lactate is highly soluble. And so what happens is this water moves by osmosis into the surrounding cells. And this has the effect to remove this water so there's less water in the ends of these tracheoles. And the effect of that is it draws more air into the ends of the tracheoles. And in fact, the final phase isn't in a liquid phase anymore, it's in a gaseous phase. But when we lose that water, what we're actually doing is opening the insect up to more water loss. How does that work? Well, let's have a little think about it. If this was the end of my tracheole here, and if there was water in the base of it, then I've only got this amount of water exposed to the air. It's a short, small surface area. If I remove that water, what I'm then doing is increasing the surface area that's right next to respiring cells and increasing the surface area by which water can be lost. But fortunately, insects have already thought about this. Where their tracheae is on the outside of the insect, what they have are these little flaps. Think of it like a manhole that can close over the top. And what that can then do is that can open and close as more oxygen is needed or not. And this is the reason why, if you've ever tried to drown an insect in the swimming pool like a wasp or something, and then they come back up and they're still alive, because all this tracheae is still full of air. So there's still a lot of oxygen inside there, so you can put it underwater, but it's still able to respire and it's likely to come back out the water and sting you. So for most of the time, the spiracles are closed and that's helping them to conserve their water and only when they need more oxygen do they open them up and that allows gas exchange with the atmosphere to take place. So what does all this mean for the insect? Well it actually means that insects can never actually be really large, they can only be tiny because they rely on diffusion and just like in humans we need a diffusion distance to be short for diffusion to be effective in supplying all the things we need or removing wastes. So when you see these horror films of these giant insects, it would never actually happen. But being small has never bothered the insect. It's said that there's so many insects in the atmosphere that if you took all the insects and squashed them together and weighed them, they would have a greater mass than all the animals on Earth. Now that's incredible.